Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about bacteria and the diseases they cause. And I first want to start you off with this picture of one of my favorite historical characters, Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who was a Dutch scientist who really knew how to dress. I, he had a wonderful wig and silk robes and nothing like my white coat. And he was the first man to see what we now call germs under the microscope in the year 1676, a couple of hundred years before Pasteur discovered the germ theory. He had a handheld single lens microscope and he saw little animacules, as he called them. Um, bacteria are mostly extracellular parasites. They do their work outside in the interstitial space between the cells. They're very small, but we can see them with the light microscope, and they're visible in detail under the light microscope. They are prokaryocytes, which means they have no distinct nucleus. They have what is called a nucleoid. This is a representation of a very, very uh, complex bacterium. Most are not like this. If you look back here, there is what's called a flagella. Um, these flagella uh, are tails that can whip back and forth and move the bacterium along, but most bacteria don't have them. So forget about this most of the time, you won't see them. These other little organelles sticking off are rather unusual for bacteria. Most of the time, it's just a cell wall, and inside is very primitive energy mechanisms and DNA coiled into a nucleoid, something that looks like a nucleus but doesn't have a membrane. These organisms multiply by division. They pinch in half after they replicate their DNA and they make two. So it's geometric growth, but geometric growth can get very fast. It's not exponential the way viruses are. However, as your mother probably told you, if you take a penny and double it every day for a month, you'll have a million dollars. Not a million pennies, a million dollars. So when you get out there, with time, these organisms can become very, very numerous in a short period of time. They tend to be translucent on a slide so that you can see right through them when the light comes through on the microscope, and we stain them so that we can see them better which brings me to the big categories of bacteria. In uh, the late 1800s, a worker in a laboratory named Christian Graham accidentally spilled alcohol on a slide. We have a number of great discoveries made by bad lab technique. They stained these bacteria in those days with a blue dye, and what Graham found was that the acetone-alcohol mixture decolorized some of the bacteria, but not all of them. So he was back to some being translucent and some staying blue. He counterstained the other ones with a pink dye, and we now have what's called gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And the reason, uh, without getting into great detail, is gram-negative bacteria as a group have one cellular structure, and gram-positive bacteria as a group have an entirely different one. And they just hold on to these dyes differently. It turns out that this also confers upon them vastly different characteristics. And as a group, they tend to be very similar. We have a third group called acid fast, and these include TB, uh, tuberculosis, and leprosy, which cannot be decolorized by acid, and they're kind of a separate group, which I'll talk to you about. Now, if we look at this slide, the um, bacteria are generally divided into gram-positive and gram-negative groups, and then we also divide them by shape. They're either cocci, which are spheres, or bacilli, which are rods. And this slide, of course, is showing you a typical example of a bacillus. We further categorize them as whether they are motile or non-motile. This is a pretty unimportant characteristic. Most bacteria can't move, and it really doesn't make much difference if they can. So that's a textbook classification. We don't really care much about that. What we do care about is whether they are aerobic or non-aerobic, or what we call anaerobic. Uh, 
Um, and this is very important, and I'll get to that when we talk about individual bacteria, but the atmosphere in which they live is critical. And so it means a lot whether they're going to live in our body under the skin, deep in a puncture wound, or on the surface, or in other uh, kind of contaminated areas, we need to know how to treat them. They have specialized protective coatings. These coatings here are called poly polysaccharides. Uh, they're made of multiple sugars and some proteins and fats bound together. And then an additional um, aspect is that TB and leprosy have a waxy coat on their surface. This is what makes them acid fast, but it also protects them. They're like the capsule you swallow with a medicine. It doesn't get all over your mouth, but when it gets in your stomach, the capsule dissolves, and so that capsule protects the medicine until it gets where it wants to go. That's what the waxy capsule does for TB and leprosy. It gives them protection, makes our defenses less useful against them. The bacterial infections of all kinds in elicit the classical inflammatory response as well as some of the immune responses. So both our responses are working together hand in hand as the debris gets picked up, you remember, and carried into the lymphatic system by macrophages. All these responses get upregulated and are very useful in our vaccines uh, to prevent these infections. There's also two terms I want you to think about when we talk about the clinical aspects. There's the first one is bacteremia. Emia means in the blood. Human tissues are sterile. All human tissues are sterile, not the surfaces. We talked about the flora of the skin, the mouth, the mucous membranes, but our deep tissues are sterile, and if they're not sterile, it's abnormal. And I say this because dog tissue is not sterile, cow tissue is not sterile. It's normal for them to have bacteria. It's not normal for us. Bacteria in the blood in humans is distinctly abnormal. And if we have bacteria, that's bacteremia. Now, that's serious. Septicemia is the other term. It's not always defined this way, but I think most clinicians will say that the difference is septicemia is not only bacteria in the blood, but they're replicating in the blood. They're actually dividing and making new bacteria in the blood. And that's an extremely serious, usually life-threatening condition that has to be dealt with. We talked about the exotoxins. Um, I want to go into them in more detail. These are usually proteins. They're almost always enzymatic, I mean, they they make other reactions go fast, and they're released during the growth and replication of the bacteria, like staph. They're very cytotoxic, they kill cells, they create dead cells and debris, and staph love dead cells and debris. It creates a milieu that's just perfect for replication. It's a, a, a perfect medium for growth. Something like botulism, the botulinus uh, bacteria releases an exotoxin too, and it's a neurotoxin. It gets into the nerve cells and it causes paralysis, and it is the most potent toxin known to man. Gram for gram, it's the most lethal toxin on earth, and people estimate that a jar full of pure botulinus toxin in a relatively uh, good-sized city reservoir could probably kill everybody in that city. The endotoxins are usually lipopolysaccharides. They're fat and sugar, which are part of that wall. And the antibiotics, as I mentioned, that kill them release the endotoxins. They are more harmful to the patient than the actual bug is itself. The bacteria may not be nearly as harmful as those toxins. Now, those are mostly gram-negative. Now that you know that we have this division, gram-negative and gram-positive, cocci and rods, most of the gram-negative rods, like E. coli, are the ones that release the endotoxins, and they cause that gram-negative or septic shock, which we'll talk about in detail when we talk about shock. Let's talk about some of the diseases these uh, guys can cause. Here's a picture of some staphylococci. 
They're called Staphylococcus because they tend to, tend to cluster like a bunch of grapes. And Staphylo comes from the word for grapes. And they classically are just the way they look here on the slide in little clusters. As you can see, they're gram positive. And um, this is Staph aureus, and it's called aureus for gold. Staph aureus uh, is a pathogen, it's a harmful bacterium, and it looks gold when you grow it out on an agar plate. It has a golden hue to it, and that's how it got its name. Here's a close-up under the electron microscope. You can really see that they are indeed little spheres. Here's a very high close-up of Staph aureus under the 50,000 power under an electron microscope. It's really an extraordinary picture. And here's what they look like when we smear them. Patient coughs up some phlegm for you. You take a drop of it and you put it on two glass slides. You smear them apart to make them thin, fix them with a little heat and stain them. You can see the white cells and you can see the little dots that are the staph. Now the infections that staph can cause are quite amazing in range. Here is the Staph aureus infection, and the most common are wound infections. They just get moved from the skin where they do no harm into the deeper tissues, either by accident or at a surgical operation where the skin isn't cleaned properly. We also have the only infection of Staph on the surface, uh, which is called um, impetigo. And uh, impetigo are honey-colored crusts of staph growing, treated very simply with washing and topical antibiotics. You can get staph crawling down into hair follicles and making a mini abscess, which we call a furuncle or a boil or a carbuncle. And they can also get onto the um, valves of the heart and cause an endocarditis, which is quite serious, and that comes from staph getting into the blood. You can get staph into the blood many, many ways. Lots of bacteria can get into the blood by patients who have gum disease. Simple chewing can get little breaks in capillaries and bacteria can get in there. And that's why patients with heart valve disease or artificial valves get antibiotics before they go to the dentist and have that manipulated. You can get food poisoning, as I've already mentioned, toxic shock syndrome, was uh, common some years ago when there were tampons that were designed to be left in for long periods, and this just allowed for the growth and the release of endotoxin from the staph. And finally, there's staph pneumonia, which is a terrible disease, very deadly, very destructive, and needs to be treated very carefully. How do we treat this? Well, antibiotics, especially the penicillin group, which we'll go into in detail, are, have always been very effective against gram-positive organisms. And um, the problem is we're developing resistance. I'm gonna to talk to you about something called MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is actually bringing us back in time to the pre-antibiotic era. We'll get into that when we talk about antibiotics. Also, I mentioned abscesses, and staph uh, sometimes will wall off uh, itself or the body will wall it off. We can't get the antibiotics in there and we generally either drain them surgically or they drain themselves to the outside or to the inside by a process called necessitation. It's an old-fashioned term. I don't know why it's called that, but it's what it is. When, a, when an abscess drains itself, it necessitates. Let's look on now. That staff, fairly significant player in diseases, this is the streptococcus. They are also gram-positive cocci. Their name means long, twisted chains. And you can see how different the strep infection is from staph. These are often skin infections, and um, they resemble staph, but instead of forming an abscess, because they don't release the same end exotoxin, uh, they, call, they cause what's called cellulitis, which is a redness and inflammatory response that spreads out over the area without ever getting to the stage of pus. So it is very susceptible to penicillin because it hasn't formed an abscess. And the other form many of you may have seen is what we call streaking lymphangitis. And that is these long streaks, if you have an infection in your hand, you'll see a long red streak creeping progressively up. 
And that is the strep in the lymphatics. It invades the lymphatics, causes an inflammatory response. It's very serious, and we worry about it when it gets high enough because it's going to become a septicemia. It's going to dump into the blood system, and it's treated very aggressively. Uh, scarlet fever with the rashes of scarlet fever is another form of strep. And the big one that we worry about is strep pharyngitis, the strep throat. It's interesting that diagnosis of strep throat is about 50-50. If you take a whole bunch of patients and a whole bunch of doctors, you'll be wrong as often as you're right from looking at it. Sometimes the worst looking throats are nothing more than a virus. Sometimes mild inflammation is strep. And it's critical that we know which it is because we have to treat this for a full course of antibiotics to prevent what I mentioned in the immune system, that small antigen antibody reaction that gets on the valves of the heart and into the joints and causes rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. The biggest problem is that the penicillin is so effective that patients stop taking it as soon as they feel better and the disease has not really been cured and these patients go on to get um, the strep, the post-strep rheumatoid disease. Very, very dangerous, really very bad for the patient. And then there's a group called Clostridium species, and the Clostridia are uh, really an interesting group and a very, very important group. The one I can talk to you about first is the Clostridium tetani seen here tennis racket-shaped rods. These are gram-positive rods for the most part with this little pink head on the end. And Clostridium tetani is present everywhere in the soil, especially around farms and ranches and in the feces of animal manures. They're really not a problem, but they are anaerobes. They don't want any air. So when you get a deep puncture wound, and you drive, let's say, a pitchfork into someone's foot or hand, the anaerobe is pushed high into the tissue, away from exposure to air, and they produce a toxin, which is a neurostimulant. It stimulates the body to what we call tetanic contractions, which is rigid, shaking contractions, and that's why it got its name tetani. Um, one of the classic signs in a patient with tetanus, and I've never seen a patient with tetanus because we don't see it anymore uh, because of the uh, um, tetanus toxoid vaccine, but there's something called rhesus sardonicus, the sardonic smile. The strongest muscles in the face are the chewing muscles and the smiling muscles, and they overpower everything else in this tetanic contraction. The patient is also curled up like this with all the muscles um, in spasm, and they look like that. Their jaws are locked, hence locked jaw, and the smile, that's the sardonic smile. They are so sensitive that you can walk into the room, clap your hands, and set off convulsions. Uh, this is treated, prevented by opening these wounds and cleaning them out, but most all, just simple tetanus toxoid immunization will completely eliminate this disease. Another one of the um, neighbors or relatives of uh, this is Clostridium perfringens, which is another gram-positive rod, causes gas gangrene. Again, it's an anaerobe, so when patients get uh, dead tissue especially, lots of injured, mashed-up tissue, and this organism in them, they can get gas gangrene called this because the, the metabolism releases gas. And you see these patients with some muscle destruction and under the skin you can feel the bubbling of the gas and see it on x-ray. Very serious disease. These patients die in hours unless you do something called surgical debridement, which is removing all the dead tissue right up to fresh, bleeding, normal-looking tissue, massive antibiotics. Another place where you see this is in illegal abortions, the so-called coat hanger abortions, because these can be contaminated with clostridium and you have injured tissue that can be the site of this. And then finally, at the other end of the spectrum is clostridium botulinum, which is another gram-positive 
positive rod with a little opening at the end like this. And this is another anaerobe. It grows in poorly processed foods because it's also present in earth. So it's available in foods where you may have green peas or any garden food where you've not properly sterilized it. Because they're anaerobes, they tend to be trapped inside the canning process where you get rid of all the air. And they can grow, and the toxin, which I mentioned is the most deadly toxin on Earth, is colorless, odorless, and tasteless. And whole families have died at their Thanksgiving dinner because they've opened up grandma's green beans and had the whole family eats the same food. It is not uh, very easily killed by heat. And the, again, the bacterium is secondary, the dangerous and the toxin. And this is the opposite of tetanus. This causes neuroparalysis. There's basically prevention by proper sterilization, respiratory support, until the patient gets over the toxin if you get to them while they're alive. And of course, this is the little bug that brought you Botox. Because Botox is botulinus toxin in very dilute form, injected into wrinkles like mine, and they relax the muscles underneath the wrinkle so that the muscles aren't pulling on the skin. It has a short life, has to be done over and over again. Uh, it's amazing the ways we find <laughs> to make use of some of the most awful toxins on Earth. Let's move to the gram-negative infections now. Um, one of the ones I'm not going to spend a lot of time on is a, called a diplococcus, the two little pink uh, cocci joining together and seen in clumps, called Neisseria gonorrhea. It's the gonorrhea um, sexually transmitted disease, about 600,000 cases a year. Um, originally treated by inducing fever. This is one of the few bugs that actually is so sensitive to body temperature, it can be killed by fever. It causes infertility. It causes pelvic inflammatory disease with abscesses in the tubes and ovaries that require surgical removal, but it can cause scarring so the patients either cannot get pregnant or they have a, <coughs> excuse me, a clogged up tube the egg, the fertilized egg, cannot get down that tube, so you have an ectopic pregnancy, which can rupture in the tube and cause hemorrhage and death, and is an emergency, surgical emergency, when it occurs. It causes abscesses, and it can cause blindness in untreated babies. The baby comes through the birth canal and gets this bug in their eye, and they can become blind. We used to treat that with silver nitrate, and now we put all, all newborns just get a couple of drops of antibiotic. It's very sensitive to the penicillin drugs and has not developed much resistance. So fortunately, we're able to still treat that. The big one now is, that I want to look at, is plague. It used to be called Pasteurella pestis, now called Yersinia pestis. Pestis coming from the fleas, the pest transmitted by flea bites, and it's called bubonic plague. If you look at this picture from long, long ago, uh, I, I chose this so I wouldn't have to show you the real thing, which is really not too pleasant. But they get these raised necrotic dead areas that are teeming with this bacterium, the Yersinia pestis, and they're called buboes. They're actually inflammatory lymph nodes, and they're quite contagious. In the Middle Ages, um, there were about 100 million deaths in the Middle East from this disease. And in North Africa in the 1500s, 25% of Europe was wiped out in the 13 and 1400s, millions worldwide. And the fleas desert the dying patient, whether it's a man or a beast, and they seek a new host. Um, what happens is, though, that this can get into the lymphatics, get into the lungs, and is then transmitted by aerosol spray, and you can give it person to person, and that's when it goes from bubonic plague to pneumonic plague, meaning the lungs, and that's when it spreads like wildfire. That's when there's no stopping it. Because droplet infection, if you've ever seen the famous photograph of a backlighted sneeze, you see that the particles can go hundreds of feet, and there's really no getting around the contamination this causes. This is a Yersinia pestis fluorescence microscopy. These little rods are what they look like. 
And then I don't know how many of you know this nursery rhyme. Ring a ring of roses, a pocket full of posies, a tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. That's from the plague. It arose during the days of the plague. It's one of our oldest nursery rhymes. And what it means is the ring a ring of roses is the rash, the red rash that the patients got during this disease. The pocket full of posies were the fragrant flowers people carried to suppress the odor of the dead bodies in the street. A tissue, a tissue was the sneezing fits that for some reason these patients get just before we die and we all fall down. So maybe that's something new slant on nursery rhymes that we teach our children. It's resurging again now in the United States. Our rodents in the Southwest carry these fleas but it's very susceptible to antibiotics. There are vaccinations that veterinarians and animal handlers can get, uh, and it should be easily controllable. I want to take a few minutes to look at tuberculosis, which is another important emerging uh, disease. Tuberculosis and leprosy, as I told you, are called acid-fast bacilli. Here they are, these little pink guys. They're rods. And they are um, they're also called mycobacterium tuberculosis. And um, this is TB that has been stained inside tissue. It has that coat that protects it. The reason I want to talk about it a little bit, it is re-emerging with a vengeance. We had a real hold on this by isolating patients with it. When I was in medical school, and there was the Cornell Navajo project where there was a lot of TB and we merely took all the active open cases off the reservation, treated them, kept them away from their families till they were no longer infective, and it practically wiped out the disease. Now there are more than uh, 1.7 billion cases worldwide, billion. Um, 10 million new cases a year, huge number developing resistance to antibiotics, very, very highly correlated with HIV and the TB-HIV combination because of the suppressed immune system is very, very common. It's factors because it's, again, aerosol spread is crowding, depression of the immune system, diabetes, malignancies, alcoholism. Um, and the infection and the disease can be quite different. If you look at this slide, what, there are several things that can happen. Here's the primary infection. The patient gets what is called a primary complex with caseation. Caseation means cheese. And it forms an abscess that literally looks like yellow rotten cheese, smells dreadful, and it is like an abscess. Here it is in the lung, here it is in the lymph node. This can go on to heal. And it can heal by scarring, and the patient can stay cured or it can become latent, and it can reactivate by a secondary tuberculosis, which is different. They get these big cavities in their lungs. It can go into other organs, like the kidneys, and the liver, and the spleen, and it can become progressive. And there's something called miliary TB. Miliary means seeds. And it's as if you sowed a bunch of seeds onto a field. What's happening is the TB is bursting out into the bloodstream from its location. And it can end up like this, almost looking like metastatic cancer in the liver and in the spleen. It's a disease uh, that we're going to have to come to grips with. We diagnose it with tuberculin testing. I mentioned the a BCG uh, vaccine that doesn't really prevent this disease, but it makes you tuberculin positive. So it makes the testing useless. Today, we don't give BCG. Instead, we test people with uh, the antigen from tuberculosis. We do a little skin test and see if they turn positive, and then we treat those patients if they have open TB. These patients can be, again, isolated or treated and uh, can be taken out of the pool, but it's uh, worldwide we're not getting to these patients in large enough numbers, and it's becoming a tremendous problem. Well, that takes us on a very quick tour of bacteriology and some of the important diseases involved. Just remind you that most bacteriology texts are about 1,200 pages and fascinating reading, and I urge you to go on and look at some more of these diseases, uh, but we'll have to stop here.
and next time we'll take a look at the viral illnesses.